Absolutely. I do not wish to politically editorialize, but we have to look at the present current event realities to understand their scriptural significance. Barack Obama has a problem. His first problem is, as a political leader, he has been a colossal failure. Despite being re-elected as president due to the incompetence and corruption of the Republican Party establishment, the establishment Republicans, despite that, he has been a colossally failed leader. He has been the most politically failed leader in the history of the Democratic Party. They have lost a total of 1,032 seats since his election. Since his election, bearing in mind he first was elected with majorities in the Senate and Congress and could have done what he wanted, he lost control of the House and of the Senate, something he personally described as a shellacking. But they have lost over 800 seats in state senates and legislatures, approximately 34 and ultimately maybe 36 governorships will now be Republican. He identified the election of Hillary Clinton as a continuation of his own term, and if she was failed to be reelected, as a rejection of his own policies. He publicly stated that, insisting that people who voted for him and vote for her because it would be a rejection of him and his policies if they didn't vote for her, well, Obviously, his policies have been rejected. The most they can do is point to polls of, of popularity. But we know, above all else, that these polls have been consistently wrong. The only poll that's been verified so far is the poll that shows that over 70% of the American public were unsatisfied with the way the nation was going under the leadership of Barack Obama. That was evident in the electoral results of the presidential election. All the other polls were wrong. He has nothing, nothing to stand on. He's concerned about a legacy now. He just assumed Hillary Clinton would win, but she has not. Obamacare is dying like a decayed fruit on the vine about to droop into the soil and decompose. Some states only have one provider left, only one. He lied repeatedly and was caught lying to the American public over 30 times. You can keep your present health care plan. He lied over 30 times making that claim. He lied over 30 times saying you can keep your physician. He lied, lied, and lied, and then lied some more. He said that costs would not exceed for working families $2,500 a year. In most states, they've gone up at least 40% to 60%, and in one state, Arizona, 117%. Barack Obama has lied and lied pathologically. It's not just his incompetence, it's his dishonesty. The whole thing is a fiasco. His legacy is dying economically of its own lack of merit, let alone the fact that it will now face dismemberment and eventual repeal under a new administration, according to the promises of, of Mr. Trump and the Republican Party, if they keep this promise. It's on its way out. He has no legacy in domestic policy, none. The nation is far more racially divided. More than that, the people who he has stabbed in the back most are the naive and foolish people who voted for him. Students? Jews, bearing in family, my own family are Jewish, and minorities, particularly Afro-Americans. Let's begin with students. On top of the student debt debacle, they have another problem now. It's not that graduates are paying higher premiums to subsidize older people. They were already covered by Medicare. No, they are paying higher premiums to subsidize uninsured people. The students realize They've been handed a crushing, crushing financial obligation that they're going to have to battle to pay in addition to paying their student loans. He didn't tell them this. He coerced, he deceived, 
he bamboozled and he manipulated, certainly manipulating the student vote into supporting him. But once he got into office, straight in the back. That is the financial and economic reality. The man has lied and lied pathologically. I live in Great Britain. I've seen socialized medicine. It does not work. Any benefit from it comes at a cost of other problems. Before Obama began trying to enforce Obamacare, using the nuclear option in Congress to do it, you had a 38% better chance to survive cancer in the United States than you did in Great Britain. 38% better! A much higher survivability rate of heart attack and cardiovascular failure in the United States than Great Britain, despite the fact that the physicians and medical colleges are just as good and they have some very, very dedicated people in the national health but the system is a bureaucratic, out of control, unbelievably costly quagmire that no British government or party can get a handle on. Unless you have private insurance, in addition to the high taxes for the national medical insurance, you're in trouble in Britain if you get seriously ill. I was recently in Pittsburgh a few weeks ago and I met an African lady from Nigeria on an elevator with a little baby girl. This baby girl came from Nigeria to Pittsburgh to have an eye transplant. Overwhelmingly, the mass of surgical and medical innovation, pioneer therapies come from the United States. The development of new drugs comes from the United States. Now we can make the argument Americans pay too much for prescriptions and we're unfairly subsidizing medications that other nations profit from. Nonetheless, we always highlight what's wrong with the American system, not what's right. Now the costs are ridiculous. The costs in America are ridiculous. Something had to be done. But all Barack Obama did was take a bad system and make it worse. A 117% increase in premiums in Arizona after he lied and said no working family would pay more than 2,500? A system where we're gonna work with your employers to lower your premiums by up to $2,500 per family per year. We will start by reducing premiums by as much as $2,500 per family. Here's what change is saying to people who already have health insurance and the employers who are providing it will work to lower your premiums by up to $2,500 per family per year. I also have a health care plan that would save the average family $2,500 on their premiums. And if you already have health care, then we're going to reduce costs uh, an average of $2,500 per family on premiums. We're going to work with your employer to lower the costs of your premiums by up to $2,500 a year. And we'll cut the cost of a typical family's health care by up to $2,500 per year. And if you've got health care, we're going to work with your employer to lower your premiums by $2,500 per family per year. And we will lower premiums for the typical family by $2,500 a year. And cut the cost of health care by up to $2,500 for family. Uh, and if you already have health care, then we're going to work with your employer to lower your premiums by up to $2,500 per family per year. You can keep your physician. You can keep your existing health plan. He lied, lied, and lied again. If that man couldn't lie, he'd have nothing to say. We will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, You'll be able to keep your health care plan, period. First of all, if you've got health insurance, you like your doctor, you like your plan, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan. Nobody is talking about taking that away from you. No matter what you've heard, if you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your private health insurance plan, you can keep your plan, period.
If you are among the hundreds of millions of Americans who already have health insurance through your job, or Medicare, or Medicaid, or the VA, nothing in this plan will require you or your employer to change the coverage of the doctor you have. Let me, let me repeat this. Nothing in our plan requires you to change what you have. Our approach would preserve the right of Americans who have insurance to keep their doctor in their plan. And when European-style waiting lists would have eventually kicked in if Obamacare was not going to be repealed, you can bet a disproportionately large amount of the first bodies in those morgues on those slabs would have been black. Obamacare's economically in ruinations. It's all based on a lie. When the Republicans had control of the Congress, they did not use the nuclear option. Harry Reid screamed it would be undemocratic to use the nuclear option where you need a simple majority to force legislation through instead of a two-thirds majority or 60% majority. But as soon as Harry Reid wanted to push Obamacare through with Nancy Pelosi, they used the nuclear option they denounced as being anti-democratic, the open hypocrisy of this. The Senate was set up to be different. That was the genius, the vision of our founding fathers, that this bicameral legislature, which was unique, had two different duties. One was, as Franklin said, to pour the coffee into the saucer and let it cool off. That's why you have the ability to filibuster and to terminate filibuster. They wanted to get rid of all that, and that's what the nuclear option was all about. And is there any likelihood that we're going to face circumstances like that again? As long as I am the leader, the answer is no. I don't th I think it. I think we should just forget that. That is a black chapter in the history of the Senate. I hope we never, ever get to that again, because I really do believe it will ruin our country. A piece of legislation that would effectively nationalize about 18% of the economy, somewhere between 1,100 and 1,300 pages, placed on the desks of members of Congress virtually the night before they were to vote on it. Nancy Pelosi said, we have to pass this to find out what's in it. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it away from the fog of the controversy. This woman is out of her mind. But so are the people in San Francisco who vote for someone like that. This is pure idiocy. Nations get the leaders they deserve. Now, I'm not trying to politically editorialize, but Barack Obama has no domestic legacy. His centerpiece, his prize, is a blithering, ill-conceived failure. Some people believe he knew it was going to fail, it was designed to fail, in order to get the nation a dependent upon an unworkable system so the only alternative would be to force socialized medicine on the rest of the country as a means of centralized political control, as we see in Eurosocialism. I don't know if that's true. Certainly he's an incompetent. Certainly he's a liar. Certainly it's not worked. He's no legacy. We look at what's happened. The students, he got them to vote for them. And as soon as they did, he gave it to them. Then there was the Jewish community, and it was speaking here in my own family. A Jew voting for Obama makes about as much sense as pinning a gold star on your chest and paying your own airfare to Auschwitz. He has been anti-Israel from the beginning, pandering to Islam from the beginning. Alan Dershowitz, professor emeritus of law, Harvard Law School, admitted Obama was a deceiver who misled him. But it's too late, Alan Dershowitz. Now, at least you have had the integrity to admit he deceived you and misled you. He will go down in history, President Obama, 
as one of the worst foreign policy presidents ever. He called me into the Oval Office before the election and he said to me, Alan, I want your support and I have to tell you, I will always have Israel's back. I didn't realize what he meant is that he would have his back to stab them in the back. Mm. And what he did was so nasty. He pulled a bait and switch. He said to the American public, oh, this is all about the settlements mm -hmm. deep in the West Bank. And yet he allowed his representative to the U.N. to abstain, which is really right. for, a resolution that says the Jews can't pray at the Western Wall. Right. Jews can't live in the Jewish quarter where they've lived for thousands of years. And he's going to say, whoops, I didn't mean that. Well, read the resolution. You're a lawyer. You went to Harvard Law School. It's the end of Hanukkah now, the Feast of the Maccabees. The Maccabees began their revolt against the Seleucids, not by waging war against the Seleucids, but by waging war against the traitors within their own ranks, the Jewish collaborators. Well, Israel and American Jewry has been betrayed by Charles Schumer, especially by Debbie Washerman Soltz, by David Axelrod, these are the Menelauses, the Benedict Arnolds of American Jewry, who have equipped this man to betray Israel. They should have known from the beginning what he was doing. At least Alan Dershowitz had the integrity to admit he was a naive, gullible individual who behaved very foolishly in believing Obama. Then we have the Afro-American community. Urban violence in the black community has gone through the roof, not only in Chicago, but most conspicuously there. Chicago, the Democratic Party machine that is home base to Barack Obama, to Rahm Emanuel, his former chief of staff, as the mayor. You know how many people were killed over the 4th of July weekend, or over Thanksgiving weekend, or now over Christmas weekend in Chicago? Gang violence, fueled by drugs coming across the Mexican border, but Obama refused to protect the border. Have a smiley, someone who is not an honest journalist. We no, from previous instances, he was caught saying things that were not true. He lied in his support for Obama's presidency. But he finally admitted it in an article in the Huffington Post. The nation's premier Afro-American journalist, Tavis Smiley, admitted, by every major socioeconomic indication, black Americans are no better off under Obama than they ever were. In fact, they are worse. Black home ownership at an all-time low, a 58% increase, and Afro-Americans on food stamps. Obama bailed out banks, threw the taxpayer money away to bankrupt companies like Solyndra, whose executives were paid bonuses and made contributions to his campaign. He bailed out the banks, but what did he do for his own people? Put them on the breadline? Afro-Americans are worse off than they have ever been. And of course, the federal government statistically lies. They do not count the long-term unemployed of the labor participation force and unemployment statistics. In other words, if you are long-term unemployed and you give up looking for a job, you drop out of the labor force and go on permanent food stamps and welfare, they don't count you as unemployed anymore. When you count the real figures, how high is Afro-American unemployment? At least double the national average of the Barack Obama. Racially divided country? More crime? More murder? More drugs? Let's look at the reality. Cities of refuge. An ultra-liberal city that he elected Nancy Pelosi, San Francisco. You've got an acute sociological phenomenon going on in San Francisco. Instead of people working in the city and living in the suburbs and commuting into the city to work, you've got the reverse. You've got Google buses taking people who live in condos in San Francisco, driving them to work in the suburbs in Silicon Valley, Cupertino, and so forth. 
It's the reverse. Traditional neighborhoods where Afro-Americans live, they're being forced out over the bridge into the slums and housing projects of Oakland. Their jobs are being taken and given to illegal immigrants on the cities of refuge. The Democrats are strangling black Americans in the Bay Area. Most of these entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley are Democrats. You go into those industries. Nearly a third of the high paid programmers of the high paid coding experts of the mathematicians, computer scientists, nearly a third are Asian. Many of them foreign students who came and had their postgraduate studies subsidized by American high tech companies. Be it Microsoft up in Seattle or Google in Silicon Valley, be it Oracle, be it any of them, Facebook, one third Asian. People not even born in the United States, they're coming from South Korea, from Taiwan, from India. The rest are white, a small number of Hispanics. Blacks are 2% of those high paid jobs. 2%. And many of them are affirmative action blacks. They only got their job because they are black, not because they're necessarily the best person for the job. Not that there are not some blacks who are qualified, but affirmative action stereotypes all blacks as being inferior, which is not the case. Some are quite qualified and capable, but they're a very small percentage. 2% black kind of, 2% uh, black employment in these high paid jobs. That's the economic future of the company and the world and of the country. Afro-Americans will have no place in the future economy under the policies of Barack Obama. None. They can't even get the service sector jobs. They're going to illegal immigrants who don't have to worry about Obamacare. What did he do to black America? He bamboozled them into voting for him. And then right in the back. Jim Crow with a smile, a political Uncle Tom. That's what he did to the Jews, what he did to the blacks, and what he did to the students. He has no legacy. In his domestic agenda, he came into office on the lie that he inherited a mess from Bush. In fact, Bush and Pawson supported some prime lending. But Hank Pawson, Bush's Treasury Secretary, and George Bush saw the warning light go off on the dashboard and began trying to put the brakes on subprime lending that was being pushed by Barney Frank in the House of Representatives, whose homosexual boyfriend was on the board of Fannie or Freddie. While Chris Dodd in the Senate found an ally, it was Barack Obama who blocked in the Senate efforts to put the brakes on subprime before the crash came. Obama did not inherit this mess. He caused it. Rahm Emanuel, his chief of staff, made $16 million brokering subprime lending deals. His other staff member, Daly, from the Daly family in Chicago, was on the board of advisors to Fannie and Freddie. And then we have the Frank Dodd legislation. The two people who caused the problem the most trying to sort it out. Mr. Obama's Treasury Secretary, the tax chief, Mr. Geithner, did nothing when he was a member of the New York Fed and Citibank began getting into trouble. But it was Obama himself who prevented the Bush administration and the Senate from putting the brakes on subprime lending when it was still time to stop the catastrophe that resulted in what happened. Obama didn't inherit it, Obama caused it. He came in on a lie and stupid people believed him and the left-wing media gave him a pass.
the one thing we can say about Barack Obama is he was true to his religion. His religion was the religion of Jeremiah Wright. And his wife gave $500 a week to a church that invited in Louis Farrakhan, a black racist who said he flies in flying saucers. Can you imagine if a Republican or a conservative was in a church that allowed in David Duke? CNN and MSNBC and New York Times and the Washington Compost gave him a pass. Jeremiah preached goddamn America. He preached that. Well, everything Barack Obama has done has been to damn America. He has no domestic legacy, none. And he's particularly hurt the people who supported him the most, students, Jews, and blacks. Now let's look at his foreign policy. The mess he made in the Middle East. He reiterated Hillary Clinton's lie, co-invented with Mr. Rhodes, about what happened in Benghazi. Knowing it was a lie, he repeated it, saying it was about this film that wasn't even illegal. But then he snatches defeat from the jaws of victory. After the Petraeus surge worked in Iraq, he leaves a vacuum, creating place for ISIS to fill it. And then he ridicules ISIS as a JV team. Ten years later, Fallujah falls back into the hands of an enemy. But this time, it's ISIS. Just a few days after Fallujah fell, the president talked about the threat from the terror group in an interview with the New Yorker magazine. He said, the analogy we use around here sometimes, and I think is accurate, is if a JV team puts on Lakers uniforms, that doesn't make them Kobe Bryant. I was disappointed. I was disappointed that he said that. Um, I don't think he was well served. Need for intelligence surveillance. Lieutenant General Michael Flynn had a front row seat to the rise of ISIS. He led the Defense Intelligence Agency until late last year. We failed to understand the enemy that we faced. Flynn says intelligence officials had warned the administration that ISIS was growing more dangerous before the president made his infamous JV comment. Look what the JV team did yesterday in Istanbul. Look what they did in Paris. Look what they did in the south of France. Look what they did in Brussels. Look what they did in Berlin. Look what they did in San Bernardino. Look what they did in Orlando, the JV team of Barack Obama. Senate, the Senate constitutionally affirms treaties. Obama concluded a de facto treaty with terrorist Iran while Iran was funding terror to kill Americans. And he gives them $150 billion. in frozen assets. Then he gets caught paying another $400 million for hostage release. He should have been impeached. He should not only have been impeached, he should have been indicted for treason, in the opinion of some people. He says the purpose of NASA is to reach out to Islam? That's the purpose of NASA? Uh, it's exciting for me to be here. Well, it's fantastic having you on uh, Talk to Al Jazeera. I know it's very rude to ask this of a guest, but my first question to you is, why are you here in the region? Oh, I appreciate you asking the question. I'm here in the region. Uh, it's sort of the first anniversary of President Barack Obama's uh, visit to Cairo and uh, his speech there when uh, he gave what has now become known as uh, Obama's Cairo Initiative where he announced that he really wanted to, this to be a new beginning of the relationship between uh, the United States and the Muslim world. 
uh, when I became the NASA administrator, or before I became the NASA administrator, he charged me with three things. One was he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into science and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third, and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and uh, engage much more with dominantly Muslim nations uh, to help them uh, feel good about uh, their historic contribution to science and engineering, science and math and engineering. He has no legacy in foreign policy and no legacy in domestic policy, but he's still trying to keep one. When Hillary didn't win, he realized the myth that he perpetuated had come to an end. So now he is trying to saddle the incoming administration with the ramifications of his pro-Islamic, pro-radical Islamic, pro-Iranian policies. The UN resolution, that will be difficult to have withdrawn or removed unless America withholds funding. I pray to God Mr. Trump does that. That'd be the only way to reverse it. This betrayal of Israel, as we have highlighted many times, in 1968, King Hussein of Jordan stated that Jordan is Palestine, and in 1970, Yasser Arafat stated that Palestine is Jordan. There is a two-state solution, according to both the Jordanian government and the Palestinian authority. It's not about a two-state solution. There's always been a two-state solution. According to the United Nations, according to the League of Nations, according to the British government, according to the Palestinian Authority and the Jordanian government, there's always been a two-state solution. They don't even want a three-state solution because we're up to four states. Hamas controls Gaza. The Palestinian Authority controls the West Bank. So now you're up to a four-state solution, but what they really want is a five-state solution. Hamas and Hezbollah admit if we give them more territory, if Israel cedes more territory, they're only going to use it to continue the jihad. They openly state this. Iran expresses its intent to eradicate Israel with a green light to continue developing nuclear weapons, thanks to Mr. Kerry and Mr. Obama and Hillary Clinton. This is the reality. Settlements? There were Jewish communities throughout the West Bank that were destroyed in Islamic pogroms in the 1920s. They are only reestablishing the Jewish communities that had always been there. Archaeology does not lie. The Jews are the indigenous people, as we've said many times. Maoris cannot occupy New Zealand. Irishmen cannot occupy County Tipperary, and Apaches cannot occupy Arizona. Neither can Jews occupy Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Jericho, or the West Bank. The whole thing is a big lie. It is not an occupation. The only occupation, the only occupation has been Islam occupying Judeo-Christian lands. Thank you so much. What we see, what Islam did to the Christian lands in Lebanon, occupied them. Now they're occupying the Jewish land. What they do to the Coptic Christians in Egypt, the Christians in Iraq, facing genocidal slaughter, their children being beheaded. Yet Israel is targeted as the culprit in the Middle East. In Syria alone, 400,000 have been killed. 400,000 Arabs, most of them Muslims, have been killed in Syria alone. But the UN is concerned about Israel. Barack Obama is concerned about Israel. John Kerry is concerned about Israel. Theresa May is concerned about Israel. Well, Jesus Christ is also concerned about Israel, only he sees things differently. But the judgment of God will come on other countries. 
right afterwards. That Russian plane went down, 92 people on it, and God's judgment will come on Britain because of Theresa May. This pandering to radical Islam at the expense of Israel, the only nation in the Middle East that protects the religious freedom and human rights of Christians, of women and of others, even homosexuals, yet they are singled out. Well, the UN did nothing about Rwanda, nothing about Sudan, doesn't says nothing about Saudi Arabia or Iran and the human rights abuses. Obama's a hypocrite, a liar, a failure, and a loser. He's not been a president. He's been a politician. He's not been a commander-in-chief. He's been a campaigner-in-chief. And he's not been a leader. He's been a liar. He was completely unqualified for his job. An affirmative action community organizer. That's what he is. That's all he is. Completely unqualified for what he was doing. He has no capacity to do anything except lie. Did not know what he was doing. Not with the economy, not on domestic policy, certainly not on foreign and defense policy. He doesn't know. I do not even know if Miss Jared, his right-hand woman, is the Iranian al -Jahiz. Is she an Iranian agent? I don't know. But the scandal and corruption of Eric Holder, of Lynch, of the politicization of the Justice Department, he is the Democrat Nixon. Only Nixon was forced to resign of the threat of impeachment. He's been as corrupt as the day is long. Everything that comes out of his mouth has been a lie. And he's trying to safeguard his, leg his legacy. But he has no legacy to safeguard. It won't work. The only question is how much damage will he do in his remaining days and how much of a harness can he put the new administration into? Again, fortunately, he has been a political failure. The Democratic Party has, a, has had unprecedented losses under his leadership and under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi, and they're the same people who are going to be in charge now. So they're not going to go anyplace except into further deterioration. But they'll make a lot of noise and do as much damage as they can. He's a wicked man. A wicked man. He's not just an incompetent. He's a wicked man. And the judgment of God would have come on America because of Genesis 12, 1 to 3, had it not been for the election of a pro-Israel president. My prayer again is that the new president, Mr. Trump, I was in the Trump Tower the other day with my wife in New York. My prayer for Mr. Trump is again that Mr. Pence, who was a Christian, a saved believer, will have a positive influence on him. I hope he keeps away from false teachers like Paula White. I hope he uses wisdom and discernment. I hope God keeps his hand on him. I hope he, I personally hope he threatens to withhold funding to the UN to force a reversal of these outrageous resolutions that have legitimized Palestinian radicalism. Nonetheless, Prophecy marches on. There's nothing Obama has not done in enabling Iran that does not fit what the scripture tells us of Daniel chapter 10. And if you subscribe to the view that there is not simply a post-millennial battle of Gog and Magog, but a pre-millennial one, for which there is substantial reason to believe could be the case, when we see what's happening now, with America not even at the table in the negotiations between Russia and Turkey, where the position of Iran is being taken up by Russia and of Syria, it's not difficult to imagine a Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario taking shape. My political disgust that the corruption of the American government and the Obama government and, and the Bush government is my personal view. But their ramifications, prophetically, is something that no Christian can fail to take into account. These things are lining up prophetically. I can only thank God, only thank God that we seem to have an Israel-friendly new administration. Because had it not been for that, 
the judgment of God would have come on America because of Barack Obama. He is a wicked, wicked man. He actually sent out letters on White House stationery to schools across America, threatening, threatening, threatening letters, implying withholding of federal funding if they did not support shared laboratory and locker facilities for boys and girls with homosexuals and lesbians. Who wants their teenage daughter going to a school like that? He lights up the White House in the rainbow colors of the homosexual flag to celebrate the Supreme Court decision, which was unconstitutional. Forcing same-sex marriage. The Constitution is clear. If the Constitution is silent about something, the states decide, not the Supreme Court. Thank God Hillary Clinton was not elected. Hopefully, Mr. Trump will keep his promise and appoint constitutionalist conservatives to the Supreme Court. This is just God's mercy. We have seen a bit of God's mercy on Britain with Brexit. And I hope with Hillary Clinton not being elected in America, a bit of God's mercy. But this betrayal of Israel, this is the working of Satan. Remember, Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat, and it's where he will get his final one. Zechariah 12, 1 to 10, Matthew 23, 39, Luke 21, 24. The Jews must be there for Christ to return, and Satan must get them out of there. Thanks to Barack Obama, that UN resolution says the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall and Temple Mount, the Wailing Wall, the Kotel, is occupied territory. He will go down in history, President Obama, as one of the worst foreign policy presidents ever. He called me into the Oval Office before the election, and he said to me, Alan, I want your support, and I have to tell you, I will always have Israel's back. I didn't realize what he meant is that he would have his back to stab them in the back. Mm. And what he did was so nasty, he pulled a bait and switch. He said to the American public, oh, this is all about the settlements mm -hmm. deep in the West Bank. And yet he allowed his representative to the U.N. to abstain, which is really right. for a resolution that says the Jews can't pray at the Western Wall. Right. Jews can't live in the Jewish quarter where they've lived for thousands of years. And he's going to say, whoops, I didn't mean that. Well, read the resolution. You're a lawyer. You went to Harvard Law School. This is horrific. This is absolutely horrific. I pray to Christ the judgment of God comes upon Barack Obama instead of on America because of Barack Obama. May the Almighty raise his hand against that wicked man. He's not one to repent. Romans 1 tells us that those who support the homosexual agenda will not repent. God gives them over to it. Well, God has handed that man over to depravity, to reprobation. May the judgment of God fall upon him quickly for the sake of America. Not that we deserve God's mercy. We don't. But God is a gracious God who has been showing us mercy. Once again, I urge Christians to pray for President Trump. Whether you like him or not, whether you voted for him or not, whether he was your candidate of choice or not, please may the Lord keep his hand upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Jacob Prash. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us obviously practicality dictates that's not a possibility the books are there they're available they're available in print the morial catalog on the morial website morial.org but 
in this day of Kindle and electronic books. They're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.